last night where we touched upon a lot of this uh, in terms of where we were and also uh, what we're moving toward in terms of remedy. Uh, I refer back to my book and I would like to do so again uh, under color of law, not for the fact of promoting the book, uh, but for the fact that I sort of anticipated in the writing of the book uh, to a certain extent of what was going to take place in this nation uh, that is now taking place. And I am still saddened that I was so on target uh, in terms of predicting uh, what the issue is, the main issue in America and race relationships today. In the book that I wrote, I stated when I was completing it in 2012, 2013, that the civil rights issue of America uh, coming into the 2000s uh, would be excessive force and police brutality. A little did I know that I was going to be so accurate uh, that the issue was going to in fact capture the nation. Now, why did it capture the nation? Uh, one of the main reasons that it captured the nation was the advancement of technology and the fact that we began to see some things uh, in reality, in real time, uh, that may have been going on for years. But there was no document and no evidence uh, to come forward to, in fact, substantiate it uh, with such a degree of clarity. Uh, people think about the cases that I have won in terms of police brutality. And first, let me say that was not my intent to get into just the area of litigation of police cases. It just seemed to fall in my lap and, and happen, but the cases that I have won have been awesome in terms of, of their precedent and, and the damage issues, but people would be shocked at the cases that I've lost. Mm -hmm. And the reason that becomes important is because the public recognizes that these ladies and gentlemen, as just was said by Janet, have a tremendous job a very dangerous job, a rough job, a job that requires split decisions and split timing that in fact involve life and death. Life and, death. and believe it or not, juries are very much aware of that. And so sometimes it becomes more p practical to think about the cases that I've lost than the cases that I've won because juries tend to give the benefit of the doubt to the police. And this is understandable when you're living in an urban environment that is infested with the type of criminal activity that we see every day. The public wants the police to protect us. The public wants to reward and understand uh, the pressure and the stress under which police officers operate. And so a lot of times when we talk about policies and procedures in terms of police departments, we have to intertwine that in terms of our understanding. Uh, the book was named Under Color of Law because the statute is 42 U.S.C. Uh, 1942, 1842, 19, 42 U.S.C. 1942. And it's a statute that was created back in 1871 along with the criminal uh, uh, statute that went along with it under the 18 U.S.C. U.S.C. is standing for United States Code and the sections there, 245, and on and on and on. And the reason that came about, let me just give you a slight historical perspective, is because after the Civil War, and after the freedom of the slaves, and we went into the area of Reconstruction, uh, the slaves, or freed slaves, were very much in jeopardy of physical harm. Death, mutilation, castration, everything that was happening in terms of this resentment of what had happened in the Civil War uh, was taking place. And people don't realize the president at the time, Lincoln was gone, and, and Ulysses S. Grant went to Congress and asked for legislation to allow federal troops and federal marshals to go into the South to, in fact, protect these newly fleet, freed people. Now, the reason it becomes under color of law because the statute actually says whoever acts under color of law pursuant to authority, regulation, or what have you, to deprive 
these people of the rights of citizenship. At first might have said color, but it evolved into the rights of citizenship. And it was called the Ku Klux Klan Act. Now, why this becomes relevant to us is because the people that were acting pursuant to this law, pursuant to Jim Crow and pursuant to authority, were basically the people in control of these small towns and rural areas and cities within the South. And the police departments, and the police chiefs, and the police were in fact enforcing, and like one person said on the show that I was watching the other day, I went to call the police, and I had this in one of my cases, and I realized that the people that were burning and destroying my property were in fact the police. So there is a historical basis uh, to how the African American community uh, perceives the interaction with the police versus what's in the subject today of the non-African American community. There are two tremendously uh, different perceptions of whether the people there are, are there to protect them or whether they are there as an occupying force. And so this is something that has developed and in Baltimore City. Uh, we have been, I don't know whether you all remember uh, Judge Ken Johnson. Mm -hmm. Well, Judge Ken Johnson was one of the great civil rights litigators of this community who an often time is not given credit. And the reason I mention that because he not only was he the main litigating force in terms of the firemen in Baltimore City, the Vulcan Blazers, but he also represented the Vanguards, which was the black police organization which was designed and came about to protect the police officers within the department from discrimination in terms of hiring, firing, and promotion. And so if you look at the fact that within the Baltimore City Department there was a history of discrimination, a history of racial exclusion, a history of non-promotion, then it's much easier to translate that uh, in terms of the actions of the police officers on the street and the reactions of the police or the people on the street to the police officers on the street. And so what we're really talking about is an inherent problem uh, in American reality that racism, as long as it exists uh, in terms of America, it's going to be accessibated or in fact demonstrate itself in a much earlier manner uh, in terms of law enforcement. And now we've had tremendous strides uh, to in fact eradicate those problems in terms of the top of the police force, uh, African American police uh, commanders, uh, and uh, heads and, and colonels and majors and what have you. And this in fact has come down throughout the departments. So we have seen uh, tremendous success. But then when we enter, as Jan and I were just talking about, when we have policies uh, that come about in terms of zero tolerance, uh, then we in fact create the, or recreate uh, the, the tension between the community and between law enforcement. Uh, when you say that I'm going to arrest thousands and thousands of people uh, without probable cause and without justification, and I'm going to put them in jail, and I'm going to hold them with no bails, I'm going to destroy their family <coughs> income and their uh, ability to, in fact, work and what have you, and you create this type of contention, and you add that along with what we all know came about in the 60s, even though that's another whole historical story as to how it came about, and that's called racial profiling. Mm -hmm. When you add these type of legislative uh, movements in terms of, of, uh, of uh, uh, racial profiling and couple that uh, with things like zero tolerance, then you in fact are creating, are creating a, 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 a breeding pool uh, for uh, discontent, uh, for violent interreaction between the public and the police and for all the things that we see now manifesting itself across the nation. So Baltimore, as we know now, is not unique. Uh, what's taking place in Ferguson, what's taking place in New York, and I say oftentimes, I know that I at one point in time was getting 30 to 40 calls a week on excessive force to the point that at my office, we couldn't take them. We didn't know where to send them. Now look at all the cases that we've taken and all the cases that we have on the docket and all the cases that are, are open at this point in time. 
And we have to say, uh, where is this nation going? We have to say, uh, when they talked about Ferguson, when they talked about Watts, when they talked about Rodney King, I used to say all the time, if they had a camera or cameras that could see what was happening in Baltimore City on a daily basis, that we as a body politic are accepting or would create a horrific response and backlash that we now see across the nation. And so this is something, just giving you that brief history, uh, that we have to look at in terms of what are the remedies, what are the resolutions, what are the abilities to resolve this problem uh, in Baltimore, in Maryland, and across this great nation if we're going to survive as a fabric of one. Uh, we have come a long way in civil rights. Uh, we as a nation have made tremendous progress. Uh, people have died and given their lives, black and white, progressive people across this nation. School integration, public facilities integration, and now we see this ugly monster uh, resurrecting itself because a state of complacency uh, that we as a progressive body of politics have come toward. That we believe that we've resolved our problems. We believe that we have been allowed to get to the promised land, which we have not. We believe that we have accomplished so much that now, as I say in the book, that we can sit on our laws in a status of complacency, thinking that black and white and racial problems don't exist anymore. I remember I was given someplace a month ago, a few months ago, and a minister is a very good friend of mine, said to me, I came up, he was having an affair, something like this, only it was younger people, and he was trying to relate uh, to the young people. I won't call his name. But he said, Dwight Pettit is here, one of those old, old time civil rights lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think he was referring to my age, because uh, we were around the same age, but he was trying to relate to his audience. And he was referring to the old, meaning that I was still involved in civil rights, civil rights litigation. And that was something of the past, or should be in the past. And so what he was saying to his audience that he's outdated, he's living in another century, well, our problems don't exist any longer. And somebody needs to awaken him uh, to that fact. And I took great offense to that. And when I did get to the mic, I in fact rejected the old, old concept of civil rights because I explained to the audience uh, that we as America have not overcome uh, these difficulties and these wars that we have fought, that we as a nation are still confronted with Jim Crow. We're still confronted people acting under authority of law. What you saw in Florida was acting under authority of law when the young man was shot in terms of the new theory of subjective determination, uh, meaning that uh, stand your ground. When you see the laws changed across this nation uh, in terms of allowing people to use subjective determination to take the life of another individual, when we see that the laws, for example, in Ferguson, that if you're leaving or walking away, that the police officer, if you're running away and you don't obey his command, you can still be shot and killed, even though he's not approaching you in an aggressive manner and your life is not in jeopardy. So we have to watch what has happened across this nation in terms of legislation, which has slowly, slowly eked away as our, as our constitutional rights for protection. And that as a matter of law, people are giving subjective determination, constitutional rights to act under law or to take one's life. And where does that go? In most cases, that subjective determination is made because of the color of your skin or the texture of your hair or the fact that you are not considered part of the majority population. And that, just like racial profiling was declared to be unconstitutional, those are very, very dangerous premises uh, to allow persons, both not only police, but civilian authority, police, and others to act pursuant and subjectively uh, to take lives without being threatened, without being in apprehension of death or danger to make those subjective determinations to take a human life and then claim they are acting under color of law. So I'll be open to questions also, and thank you very much for your time and attention.